Hey guys, all right, today we're going back to Swib Swibney. I still don't know how to pronounce the name. <laughs> I'm sure someone's told me, but I forget. Uh, this time, we're going to be watching the Animated History of Poland, Part 1. So, uh, yeah. I know Lithuania was the last country to become uh, Catholic. Uh, so, you know, Poland, that area, you know. Stayed pagan for quite some time. Uh, there was the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. I know about that. Polish Hussars. Siege of Vienna. Uh, the Partitions. That's, that's really about all I know about Poland. So, let's go ahead and jump in. Oh, and uh, they pretty much were largely unaffected by the Black Death. So, yeah. This video has been made possible by The Great Courses Plus. Use the link below or head to the Great Courses Plus slash Sweeney for your free one month trial and to show Sweeney. your support for okay. the channel. Stick around to find out more. If you live in Central or Eastern Europe, you probably grew up hearing the folktale of the three brothers, Lech, Czech, and Rus, the three legendary patriarchs of the Slavic peoples. While out hmm. on a hunting I've trip, never heard the brothers them. had a disagreement, as brothers do, on which prey to follow, leading them to split up. Czech, the eldest of the brothers, followed his prey to the Czech clans. Rus, the youngest, went east and became the founder of Russia, and Lech, in the middle, founded Poland. Because who cares about consistency? <laughs> the tale differs slightly from place to place, but many include that Lech travelled north as he followed a beautiful white eagle. The eagle landed in its nest at sunset and looked very breathtaking against the red sky. Lech took this for an omen and decided that the land would be his new home. The white eagle is still a symbol of Poland, blazoned against the red sky. Indeed, Poland did begin with Slavic settlements. The Slavs are likely a civilization that emerged as remnants of the early Indo-European peoples who had migrated out of the Caucasus. From their homeland in Central Europe, they began to expand and migrate in response to the weakening of the Roman Empire. You'll remember this from previous episodes as the Great Migration Period. Yes, the Poles loved the new that. home, which they shared with Germanic tribes from Scandinavia and the occasional Asian nomadic raiders. The Slavs of Poland were organized into smaller tribes living in and around the Baltic Sea and the Vistula River Delta. They united under Poland's first official leader, Mieszko. Mieszko was a Duke of the Polands. This was a good. There also exists an older theory that the name of Poland comes from the Proto Polish word Polak, meaning sons of Lech. It denotes the connection between the semi mythological patriarch Lech and his descendants, the Poles. Gig to have since the hmm. tribe eventually became the name of the whole country, Poland. Mieszko was a member of the noble house of Piast, whose dynasty would rule Poland for centuries. With his baptism in 966, nice. the country slowly abandoned traditional Slavic paganism and adopted Western Christianity. Mieszko's son Bolesław the Brave expanded the territory south into what he hoped would be a strong regional power, but alas, it was a bit too early for that still. <laughs> he established the Metropolitan See at Gniezno, forming the headquarters of what would become the Catholic Church in Poland. His consolidation of power led him to be crowned Poland's first official king, and then he died, all in the same year, oh. which is great. F. The Piast dynasty the was somewhat up and down, and internal conflicts often plagued the royal court. Until this guy, Kazimierz the Restorer, restored the monarchy's control, which come to think of it is probably why they called him the Restorer. <laughs> he modernized <laughs> Poland into a yeah. feudalist society, you know, which came conclusion. with all its cool things like knights and lords and castles. This helped secure the borders, who up until now had changed depending on who was king. The early kingdom, somewhat weaker than its neighbours, and strapped for cash, did however hold the Mongol invasion into Europe, having been sacked twice before. Notable of Damn. this time was the Polish relationship just with the Germans, whose dukes and- Oh boy. Kingdoms and empires in these times were far less ethnically homogenous than they are today. The Holy Roman Empire was mostly German-speaking, but a German ethnic identity was non-existent at this point. The HRE had a sizable minority groups of Poles, Bohemians, French, Danes, Proto-Dutch, Italians, and other communities. There were also large populations of Germans in neighboring kingdoms such as Poland, Hungary, and Italy, both as lords and peasants. Yes, 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 yes. So, Northern Italy, well, the French also have a lot of Germanic, because they, they're descended from the Franks, so honestly, they may have a Romance language, but... 
they themselves are pretty much i'd say they're germanic their their culture group pretty much evolved from is a combination of uh germanic and uh catholic romantic ish uh influences uh but yeah the hre is definitely a diverse group um uh, i mean the german empire and the french empire i would definitely say were certainly ethnically homogenous uh empires but the british empire no um The Ottoman Empire certainly wasn't. It had Turks, Arabs, uh, Egyptians. You know, it had a, uh, that one was very. Uh... So, yes and no. I go with that little bit of tidbit that Sweeney has in the bottom right hand corner. The lords had come to possess to large add. amounts of the West. I, I had a concept in my head for what I wanted to say, but. Uh, I forgot it. And the Teutonic Knights I had a who point, had carved out a significant it. state for themselves in Livonia and Prussia, a land inhabited by pagans, frequently raided by crusaders. By the time Piers' rule ended with Casimir the Great, Poland had lost much of its territory to its neighbors, but with a period of peace, the state soon began to prosper and attract Jewish settlement. The counties in this area became a source of contention between the kings of Poland and the Holy Roman Empire, who fought over the local lords for fealty and allegiance. This resulted in these counties being very mixed with populations of people from both kingdoms. The whole thing was very unbohemian, really. The Jews first settled Poland as merchants on popular trade routes. By this century, the Jewish people had settled in great numbers over many kingdoms in Europe and began their long and very sad history. They were expelled by the masses in all the countries they settled and were often victims of massacres and worse, crusades. Successive yeah. expulsions led the population in Poland to swell, which was a comparatively more tolerant society, which became a center of Judaic learning. Hold up. I just gotta make mention of that. Uh, it was very, very small. Who, uh, when he said they were, uh, relatively speaking, a more tolerant people. That does not mean they were uh, tolerant by you know modern day standards of course but you know they were able to live there um which i think is very important to note uh because you know you'll hear things about like oh yeah th this country was tolerant they allowed these people to live here and yeah, they may have allowed them to live here doesn't mean they were treated well. in culture as the centuries continued However, I I things weren't always decently. super peachy and anti-jewish riots often erupted in polish towns and synagogues yeah. were frequently burned King Casimir the Great, dying without an heir, left his kingdom to his nephew Louis, the King of Hungary. Louis left his now three kingdoms to his daughters, one of whom died unexpectedly, the other, who was supposed to inherit Poland but inherited Hungary instead, and the last one, Jadwiga, who got Poland. Huh? The nobles of Poland welcomed Louis's daughter and crowned her king. Yes, king, not queen. Don't ask. Jadwiga's okay. life would not be unlike a medieval television drama as she was simultaneously engaged to both the Grand Duke of Lithuania, Jagela, whose kingdom was huge and powerful, and the Habsburg Duke of Austria, who was inbred and fat. <laughs> I think she made the right choice. The union of Jadwiga and Vladislav. Oh my god. <laughs> who is <was> inbred? <laughs> the Polish Lithuanian Union, which was now the largest country in Europe under a single monarchy. The Lithuanians had become a strong military power in the previous century, capturing large amounts of Russian and Mongol land. The now combined countries spread from the Baltic to the Black Sea. The Lithuanians, with their far smaller population, never ventured too far from their castles, why would you, and preferred to rule Ruthenia from Livonia instead. So by the time of the Union, the much larger Polish population came to dominate the Ruthenia lands, spreading the language and the culture, eventually dwarfing their Livonian allies. The Teutonic Order, that German state on the Baltic, had become somewhat of a bad neighbor, leading raids, crusades, and plundering castles, or otherwise stumbling drunk into Polish-Lithuanian territory, starting fires and whatnot. Oh my the union God. of the two states proved beneficial, handing the knights a crushing defeat at the Battle of Grunwald in 1410. They also fought numerous wars with the Muscovites, Tatars, and Ottomans. 
Noteworthy of the Hegelian period was the efficiency of the feudal system and the pseudo-democratic nature of the parliament, who set up sophisticated bureaucracy for king approval, or disapproval if you are unlucky. Within just a few decades, the Teutonic Order had completely lost their state with the Well, I wouldn't necessarily... Mm. If it worked as it should at all times, then yes, it was a great system. However, you know, it was obviously a way for the local nobility to pretty much have a control over the kingdom, in a way. It was their way of controlling the king, controlling the royalty. So, yeah. The western half being annexed directly into Poland it and the rest becoming a faith of the Polish crown. This gave access of Poland to the prosperous Baltic seaports and an explosion in trade. Keep your eye on this, it becomes important later. Oh, the Prussian okay. faith would later be inherited by a duke from Brandenburg, a state within the Holy Roman Empire, a trend which would become ever more troublesome as lords within the HRE would increasingly inherit lands outside the imperial borders. The HRE was weird, don't worry about it. Acquiring Danzig or Gdańsk had huge economic benefits, and cities swelled in size in response to the trade boom, like Poznan, Lwów, and the capital Kraków, and most notably Warsaw. Warsaw, or Warszawa in Polish, was up to this point just a small fishing village. Legend has it that a fisherman named Warsh happened upon a mermaid in the Vistula River named Shava. The two married and found the town of Warsaw. The Poles, like most Europeans, were often embroiled in wars, and this made famous their heavy cavalry, the Winged Hussars, which I'm sure I'll be mobbed and lynched if I don't talk about. <laughs> Initially a contingent of Hungarian mercenaries, the Hussars soon became an elite shock cavalry so powerful they allowed the Poles to win many otherwise hopeless battles. The Hussars became the envy of Europe, the most powerful. The wings on the Hussars made loud noises when blown by the wind. This served to train and condition the horses, intimidate the whole enemy, and also provided protection for the rider's rear. The most famous use of this elite cavalry was the Battle of Vienna, which I made brief mention of at the beginning, where the Poles completely obliterated the Turkish army, halting their advance into Europe. Awful and disciplined heavy cavalry the Middle Ages had ever known, and are still a matter of intense national symbolism of Poland. Yeah. The 16th century was they are. a really big one. It included the Protestant Reformation, affecting mostly German parts of the kingdom, wars against the encroaching Ottomans invading Europe, advancing in science and literature with Copernicus, devising the heliocentric model of the solar system, Copernicus the nationwide codification of, the, of the Polish language, and the well, biggest one, Europe. the changing of the Polish-Lithuanian Union into the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, a single political entity ratified by the Polish Parliament, or Sejm, with elected rather than hereditary kings. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, or just Poland for short, became a center of power and commerce, and a bulwark against invading Turks would become a larger and larger problem for the European powers since their humble beginnings in Central Asia. During the Polish-Muscovite War, the Poles became involved in the Russian succession crisis, or the time of trouble. Polish King Sigismund III, Vasa, supported two false Dmitris as pretenders to the Russian throne, and invaded Russia to solidify the claim. His son, Prince Władysław, was, selected, was elected Tsar during the course of the war and began flexing their muscles with their famous Hussars. They even occupied Moscow for a short period but were soon driven out because invading Russia is simply impossible unless you are the Mongols. The series of <laughs> northern wars and the Russo-Polish war left the Commonwealth in a very precarious and weakened state. This was aggravated by the election of Polish kings which opened the door for other nations to meddle in Polish affairs, which they did. Yeah, this is what I was During talking the about wars, earlier. the Commonwealth yeah, yeah, lost yeah, yeah, the territory yeah. of Livonia and was devastated by the so-called Swedish deluge, leaving much of the nation in ruins. Poland became weakened during the Great Northern War against Sweden, and during the War of the Polish Succession, it became increasingly clear that Poland's fate was going to be decided by its neighbours. The Polish Parliament became ineffective due to complicated veto laws which made passing reforms or mounting resistance to invasion nothing if not impossible. The political limbo and the sheer size of the Commonwealth started to make cutting pieces out of it look pretty attractive. The last king of Poland, Stanislav II, was elected in 1764 as a puppet of the Russian Empire, aided greatly by the fact that he was in bed with Catherine the Great. Stanislav did attempt reform to try and save face, but was aware the kingdom was on its last breath. Before long, the first partition of Poland was enacted, dividing the outlying provinces between Austria, Prussia and Russia. In dire straits, the parliament was powerless to stop the invading troops and forced to ratify the new borders. The Great Sejm tried once more to reform by drafting a formal constitution inspired by the liberties of the French Revolution. 
but it was enough to provoke Russia again, who saw France as an enemy and Poland as a yeah. sympathizer to anti-monarchical sentiments. It was a bad idea, Pro Poland. and anti-constitutional forces became embroiled in a war, and Russian forces invaded to broker a defeat to the Republican movement. Polish troops were actually winning against the Russians, but were ordered by the Polish king to surrender himself to surrender. Himself later named a traitor, the petitions are known as the Great Crime of Empires. The world looked on with shock at the brazen destruction of Polish sovereignty. With an agreement I don't know if they were too with Russia, the two nations annexed more territory cared. in the Second Partition, reducing Poland to one third its size and population. The king was horrifically unpopular. The army was in shambles. The parliament was divided and powerless. The common people were furious, and insurrections led to the National Rebellion led by the military veteran Tadeusz Kościuszko. After an initial success, the rebels failed to garner support from many other nations and were defeated by the surrounding powers. In 1795, the Austrians, Prussians and Russians decided to put an Ding end bang. to the rebellious Poles and invaded them from three sides. The Third Partition of Poland, as it became known, wiped Poland off the face of the map for the next century. Millions of Poles now found themselves subject to whichever nation well, you know, they'd, they'd be back for a brief time period under uh, Napoleon, and then they'd die again. They were divided into, isolated from one another, and Poland ceased to exist. Now, as you all know, if you've ever picked up a map... That, honestly, I think was probably his best video that we've watched so far. It, so, my issue with his other videos is that they go really, really fast. Which, you know, is fine. However, that's not personally my preference uh, with how fast he would go in those other videos. This one felt way more concise. Uh, not as much information coming at you as quickly, but still covered a good amount of information really in, in a short amount of time. Uh, so, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this one. Um, that's going to be it for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Remember to leave a like down below. Uh, write a suggestion in the comment section down below for what you want to see me react to next. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you.